here it is tonight, embracing spiritual practices. Let me pray, and then we will uh, just jump right in. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this lesson. And as we focus on worship, I ask you, Lord, that you would release it in our hearts even more than talk about it. Father, give us the, the longing and the heart for it. Uh, you're worthy of all of our worship. And I pray you would open our eyes, open our heart, and do what you want to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. Again, we're in our discipleship track three called Embracing Spiritual Practices, and this is session three called The Practice of Worship. We're looking at different practices. We first focused on the practice of Scripture. We focus on the practice of prayer, and then tonight it's about the practice of worship. We're using that word practice because it's in the letter that Paul wrote to the Philippian church, and really it's about spiritual disciplines. If you want to know, it's just a different word for that. And so as we discuss this, I want to talk to you about our two goals. Number one, we want to define and describe what it means to worship God as outlined in Scripture. That's the first thing. The second thing is we want to identify worship practices and learn how to incorporate them in our daily lives. I want to tell you a quick story before we jump in. Uh, many of you have been with us for at least a few years, and those of you that weren't, you'll, you'll be able to uh, you know, just sort of glean from this story. But in November of 2020, we received uh, a mandate, a health order mandate from the governor of Washington State. His name is Jay Inslee, as you might know. And this mandate stated that churches were not permitted to have corporate singing in their gatherings. And the reason that they, of course, did this was based on the pandemic and the health concerns. And this was people in a back room getting together and thinking about how can we make uh, Washington State more healthy. And so they issued all of these health orders. And again, not trying to agree or disagree, but when we got that mandate, we had tried to be somewhat reasonable with all of these health orders. We, we were trying, trust me. If you don't think we were trying, we were trying. And we learned that you can't control people. <laughs> There's that. Control is, is an illusion, especially, and you learn that when you raise kids. But anyhow, it was our perspective at that time that we should always pray, that we should always study the Word of God. So that's what I did. I noticed a lot of people right away were like, I agree or I disagree. And it was interesting to me to have some people just right off the bat, no prayer, no thinking about it, no dialogue, no nothing, no study of the Bible. We're just going to get angry because we don't want to be told what to do. And so there, were a lot of, there was a lot of uproar. So we're just going to get mad and react. Friends, I want to tell you, no matter what the situation, that's never a good thing. You're not going to manifest Christianity. You're not going to look like Christ if all you do is react. So what we had to do was pray. I've never been told before, nor have I ever thought as a pastor that I would be placed into a situation where I would have to come to a congregation and go, hey, guys, we're not going to be able to sing together, even though it's a fundamental thing that we do as a people. And it has been for thousands of years. This is a precedent. This is a biblical precedent that we're not going to be able to do that for uh, until the government says that we can't, until they tell us that it's, it's healthy. So I had to really think about that one. And I went to prayer and I studied the Word of God, and, uh, and everybody shared their opinion with me, as you can imagine, and uh, there was no shortage of that. Thank you. Love you. Don't mind if you do. Um, but by the way, you only have to share it once. I heard you the first time. You know, if that's you. <laughs> Let me reiterate it in case he doesn't get it. No, I, I'm, I'm all right. I'm, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but it takes one time. So as I begin to pray about it, you know what happened when I looked into this book? I rediscovered the principles of worship. I rediscovered how important singing is. That singing isn't all that worship is, but singing is profoundly something important as it's connected to this issue of worship. Did you know there's over 900 verses in the Bible that talk about singing to God as a, as a primary form of worship? One of the ways you can discover that quickly is the Psalms. I was in the middle of people debating as to whether or not we needed to even sing. Well, you know, you don't really even need to sing. All of a sudden, we're throwing out thousands of years of church history of being a singing people because we don't know what to do with a health order. And so I just decided after lots of hours of studying and lots of hours of praying that it wasn't 
for me to come against the government and, and get angry and be anti, that, that wasn't what I was going to do. But I came to our church and I said, under no circumstances will I ever and can I ever tell you whether or not you can sing to God. And that's the way that we, we went on that. And so that was, again, debated. But I just came to discover that worship is not something that I can compel or control. But I, don't, I do not agree that we can reduce worship down to like just being together or just felt that there is something about us being, being a singing people. And when you study the Bible, as we're going to see tonight, you just simply can't get away from it. So I didn't know what to do with this piece of paper on one hand, because I'm like, well, I want to be submissive and I want to be honoring. But on the other hand, I'm like, I'm really placed in this conundrum where we gather together and we're trying to be healthy. And I care about you and you care about me. And we're trying to do this well and, and not kick health to the, core, to the side. But we were in a conundrum, and I decided that, listen, if you don't want to sing, you don't, don't sing. If you want to sing, sing. I'm not here to tell you what to do. We're going to sing. And I remember the first gathering that we had, it was so weird. Uh, can you guys just smile right now? It'd be really nice if you just, it's not heavy, I'm just explaining, you know. It's like, whatever, Jake Inslee's not going to pop out of somewhere, and like, hey, you know. In fact, I don't think he's ever watched one of our services, so there's that. But um, I remember the first day that we received the health order and we were praying like we were praying and then somebody was oh it's like one person can can have a mask on singing and we're not against masks like if you wear a mask that's great you know we want people to do what they feel compelled to do that's our church mitigate your own risk and we judge no one for their decision on what they make to steward their own health and that was the way that we went so there wasn't any judgment either way that was the decision that we have made and will always make this is that place for personal conscience on those issues. But I remember we had been praying, and I pray passionately. I'm like, God, I pray that you would move in power and pour out the Holy Spirit. And, and then I remember getting up here, and it was like, we, we're not supposed to worship now, but I'm, there's no difference in what I was just doing down there because I think sometimes they write these orders and they don't realize there's Pentecostals out there. We don't just sing that way, friends. We pray that way. We speak that way. I'm loud that way. That, it's like, there's no difference to me, you know? And so it was like, you're definitely not writing this for everybody. But the point that I'm trying to make is that when I dug deep in that time into the scriptures, I rediscovered the sense in which the, the scriptures teach us about singing unto the Lord. And it, I would tell you this, if you're not convinced of it, you've got to go deeper into the, what the word says. And I pray that, that tonight that we would have that happen. And sometimes it takes a cultural moment, a pandemic maybe, a, different worldviews colliding and clashing so that we can look at the scriptures and say, what does God think and what does God say? And this brings me to an important point in, in our journey through this, this, this discipleship track, which is em, embracing spiritual practices and the practice of worship, we've got to understand what worship is. And that's the first thing that I want to do tonight is define worship for you. So let me do that just for a few minutes. On your paper, paper you'll notice the definition of worship. The word worship or similar words are used about 200 times in the Bible. Now that isn't the only word that's used to denote what we're talking about. But that specific word is used 200 times, Old Testament, New Testament. In the Old Testament, there are three primary Hebrew words. One of them is used four times as much as the rest. And this word is, is translated 80 times, and this is what it literally means. When you see the word worship in the Old Testament, almost always it means to bow down. It means to bow low. And the idea was this. When you come before a king, you bow before a king. This was a concept and an understanding. It was paying homage to. In a divine sense, when they used the word worship as it connected to God, you were to bow low, you were to pay homage to. He is greater and I am lesser. And that's what that action was. So it was a physical action connected to this expression. It wasn't just I worship you. It wasn't just a statement. There was a physicality to it. Very important. And all of the words that are translated worship carry that connotation. Very important to recognize this. There are other words in the Old Testament translated worship, and they can also mean to serve. I know they're translated differently sometimes, or to do homage. It means to do something. There's action attached to it. In the New Testament, this is the Greek language originally, and the primary word used there, it also literally means to do reverence to. 
It means to bow down. It means to bow low. Don't get the prostate prostrate uh, word uh, confused. Sometimes pastors do that. But to, to prostrate oneself is to bow low. Uh, you got to make sure you get the right word, ladies and gentlemen. It's happened to me on the stage. I just wanted to say it up front. But it means to lay yourself down before. This is what the word literally meant. And when they heard it in their culture, because the Bible was originally written in different languages, there was a picture attached to the language. Greek and Hebrew are, are alphanumeric languages, and they're picture languages. So when you say something in these ancient languages, there are oftentimes a picture associated with it, and it would connect them to an action, not just a concept. In the Western world, our, our languages typically have less of that connected to it. I mean, some of our euphemisms or or metaphors, these words can be, but that's not necessarily always the case. But the languages of the Bible are certainly this way. So knowing all of this, that it means to bow down and to bow low, what are we talking about when we use the word worship? Well, I want to give you a definition. And here's my definition. For the Christian, worship is responding to God. Everybody say respond. Okay, it's responding to God with love and honor in all that we say and do. That's, that's my definition. Worship is responding to God. He's the initiator. We're the responders. We're responding to God in all that we say and do. Worship is to declare his worth, the worth of God. It's to obey the will of God. It's to show our love and our gratitude, our thankfulness for him and to him. And while worship is often defined by what we say and do, it is always a response because of who he is and what he has done. Both are important. God is creator. God is magnificent. God is above it all. God, there is no one like God. And so we worship him because he is that. But we also worship him personally because of what he has done for us. He is not capricious or whimsical. We know that the creator of the heavens and the earth as revealed in the Bible sent his one and only son as a sacrifice for us to bring down the wall of hostility that our sins have built up so that we could have relationship with him again. He didn't just create us, but we walked away from the creator and then in Jesus, he brings us back. So we worship him because he is the creator but we also worship him because he's the lover of our soul. He didn't just let us go astray. He brought us back. And so we worship him for both. But sin has distorted the human heart from our pure worship to God. And the scriptures show us that we are hardwired to be a worshiping people. I want you to walk away knowing this tonight. That if you don't worship God, you will worship something. Because we're not the creator. We didn't create ourselves. We didn't get here on our own. We were given this ability to create or reproduce because God gave it to us. And so implicit, hardwired into us is this desire, this innate desire to worship something or someone. And if it isn't God, the God of the Bible, it will be replaced with something or someone else. Friends, that's what the Bible calls an idol. That's what we temp sometimes today call an addiction. An addiction is a modern day idol. We are worshiping something in place of God. It is controlling and compelling our life. It is telling us what to do. It is telling us who we are. Sometimes we do the same for people in our world. We tend to call like celebrities like icons or that's my idol. Friends, don't ever use that word. That's a bad word. You might just say, I like them, I, I think well of them, I, I think they're gifted in talent. Don't call them your idol. They're not your idol, okay? America has a lot of idols, but you can watch it, you just can't worship it. Amen. So we're just here to say that God is the one we worship, and if it isn't him, it will be something else. I want to divide our understanding of worship into three different categories. The first one is this, personal worship. Let me read to you Romans 12 and verse 1. You know it well. Therefore, Paul says, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, this is because of what God has done, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, and this is your spiritual service of worship. Oh, he tells us what it means to worship God. He calls every believer 
to give their entire lives. This is where somebody like me would say, when you follow Jesus, it is all or nothing. In, in fact, that's what Paul defines as worship. It's to give our full self. That means our mind and our heart and our hands and our feet and our mouth and our words. It's our full expression that we give to the Lord. There's a calling on your life. This would be a great time to silence your cell phones. I love you. To give our entire selves to God. Friends, that's everything. That, that's what the Lord is longing and looking for, is that we give him back what he gave to us. Well, what did he give to you? He gave you life. He gave me life. So I give him my life and nothing less. That's the form of worship that he desires. That's why Paul says that we are living sacrifices. We put ourselves on the altar. We don't just put something on the altar. We put ourselves on the altar. You can have it all. You can consume, like a fire consumes a sacrifice. You can have me, everything that I am, to have it all. And this is what Paul calls the people to. And so we don't want to negotiate with the Lord. Amen. We want to give a presentation, not a negotiation. So we present to him all that we are in response to his mercy. And the second part of this, though, that's the first part. It's very personal. Worship is very personal. Second, we see this in the Old Testament, this understanding of tabernacle or temple worship. It's a very external thing. And, and I think sometimes we don't know what to do with that. What do we do with the worship in the Old Testament? I mean, there's sort of a lot going on there. Well, let me sort of break it down for you. As, as God brought his people out of slavery in the book of Exodus, he established worship in the wilderness through the tabernacle. That was the place of his presence. In Exodus 25 through 40, it details all that God established concerning the tabernacle and the priestly ministry. We don't have time to go through all that, but just understand that they would have to set up a tent and this was the tabernacle, the place of God's presence, the holy place and the holy of holies. They believe this is where God's presence was. In fact, it was where the manifest presence of God dwelt, the glory, the Shekinah of God, visibly on the earth at that time. God can find, not his entire self, but what they could have, what they could know about his presence to this specific place, this tent, this tabernacle. And they had to care for this. They had a, a specific tribe of people that were set apart to minister on behalf of the people to the Lord, called the priests. And there are all these details and commands. Leviticus chapter 1 through 7 details the sacrificial system that would be used in the wilderness as the priests would come before God on behalf of the people and sacrifice, on behalf of their sin or sometimes a free will offering. And in 1 Chronicles, this is where King David brought back the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem and he vowed to make the presence of God the centrality of his kingdom because what happens in the Old Testament is not only does, do we have sort of a conundrum here with the tabernacle shifting to the temple, that, that happens, that's a long story, but what you end up happening is the Ark was taken the ark, which is supposed to be the presence of God. This is sort of where he confined himself. I mean, it's kind of strange, but this is what he did. It was a type. It was a shadow of what was to come. And the ark was taken. And so David vowed to bring it back, put it into the tabernacle so the people of God could worship, knowing that his presence was with him. And when David vowed to bring back the ark of the covenant, it's unbelievable what he made a decision to do when it comes to worship. And we often don't think about this, but when you read 1 Chronicles 23 to 25, you see this. Listen, David chose 24 families, and they were led by elders of those families to minister to the Lord, and he stationed them around the ark. And they had 24 singing prophets, and they sang day and night. I want you just to think about that. He set up a system where there were 24 prophets singing day and night that were accompanied by 288 of their brothers and their sisters, these, these singers. The backup band was about 4,000 musicians, 4,000 gatekeepers, 6,000 judges and officers were appointed to handle the operations, the logistics, and the finances of the tabernacle alone. David paid the salary of 4,288 singers and musicians, another 4,000 gatekeepers and their families, and he kept it going for 33 years. How would you like to administrate that? Read 1 Chronicles chapter 23 through 25. David spent roughly in today's economy about $100 billion in 33 years to keep prayer and worship going 24 hours a day. 
What did he know that sometimes we may not know? What did David know? Why would you do, why would you have 4,288 singers day and night, night and day? What was it about David? What picture did he have? What was he captured by? Why, why would he say this is what's valuable? I want to spend all this money so that we can worship God in this way to make sure that this is happening 24 hours a day. Well, maybe it is that David, in stewarding the tabernacle in his day, caught a glimpse of the book of Revelation. Look at this in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8. It says, The four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever. Look at this, the 24 elders. Did I tell you 24 elders in the First Chronicles? 24 elders, 24 families, 24 singing prophets day and night. And they changed rotations. It says 24 elders who sit on the throne. They worship him who lives forever and they cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and because of you, because of your will, they existed and were created. Many people interpret this and they understand that David, you know, way before Revelation was written, we're talking hundreds, if not a thousand years before, 800 years before, maybe a thousand years before, if, I th- if I'm accurate here, he had a glimpse of what we see in Revelation. He established these singers and musicians to constantly offer before God day and night this worship. Friends, I, I just want to point this out because what you see in the Old Testament, you see in heaven. And there's a longing for even God's people because when you read the book of Revelation, it says that everybody who surrounded the throne began to sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Can I tell you what that means for us tonight? Let's not check out during the time when we sing to God. Let's not look at that as a light thing, a little thing. It's a big thing. It's a mass. It's a biblical thing, isn't it? It's powerful. Well, this leads us also to the New Testament or the New Covenant where congregational worship was established. We see in the Old Testament worship was centered around the temple in Jerusalem as we've talked about later. First it was the tabernacle. Later it was the temple. But we know that this all changed in the new covenant through the person, the work of Jesus. One of the revelations that we get is from John chapter 4 where Jesus is interacting with a woman at this well in Samaria. And this is what it says in John 4.21. Jesus said to this woman, Believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and now is when the true Worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. What is Jesus doing? This is a massive shift because this woman was thinking that the Jews only believe that you can worship God in Jerusalem, but Samaritans had set up another place where they could worship. It's one of the reasons that the Jews hated the Samaritans because they believed they were blasphemers. They don't go to Jerusalem. They don't don't go to that temple. They've established their own tabernacle where they worship God, where they make sacrifices. That's one of the reasons they had hostility. And she's talking to Jesus and Jesus says, you don't understand. The time is coming and is now upon you where true worshipers will do so in spirit and in truth. And so what he's establishing is no longer about where you worship. It's about who you worship. That's the point that he's trying to make. And so Jesus makes the Father's desires clear that those who are born again enter into this relationship, this glorious relationship where we give to him everything that we are. We sing to him, we share with him, we obey him. It's everything, it's all or nothing. This is the worship that God longs for. And the New Testament goes on to show us that as believers gathered together, they would worship the Lord with singing and with songs and with psalms, encouraging each other day and night. It starts in Matthew 28 and verse 17 after Jesus had risen from the dead. Look at this. It says, when they saw the resurrected Christ, they worshiped him, but some were doubtful. But look what they did. When they saw the resurrected Christ, they began to worship him. 
There are many other passages throughout the book of Acts where they worshiped him. You remember even after the Holy Spirit had come and it says they were speaking in tongues and they were prophesying. One of the translations says they were declaring the praises of God. They were doing it in 13 different languages. The whole speaking in tongues thing was, is an amazing spiritual phenomenon, a supernatural manifestation of God's glory where they're speaking in 13 different dialects and it says they were all declaring the praise of the living God. That's what all these people were hearing in their own language. In, Ma- in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, it gives us insight into the gathering of the Lord and how that should happen, kind of like what we do here tonight, what we do on the weekends. They say, Ben, why do we do this? Why do we have singing and why do we have teaching and why do we have spiritual gifts and why do we give prophetic words and why do we have prayer time and why do we have fellowship? Well, we're just following a, a biblical model. It's in the book of Acts. It's It's in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. It says, when you gather, one has a tongue, an interpretation, a teaching, a revelation, a hymn, a psalm. This is what we're doing. It's literally what we have have just done. And so we're trying to follow this. And God's people have always been a singing people. It's absolutely a a form of worship. It's an expression unto God. And it's one of the most important ways that we worship the Lord as we surrender Now, we're not talking about singing without surrendering. We're talking about singing and surrendering at the same time. We are a singing people. Ephesians 5.19, Colossians 3.16 talks about singing songs and making melodies, and we do that together. Now, some of you aren't great at making melodies. That's okay. Aren't you grateful that whatever your melody is, it's like speaking in tongues and he can interpret it? The Lord doesn't care, does he? The Lord looks at the heart. If you don't sing well, it's all good to Him. It's all good to Him. He loves it. We might have different preferences and styles and all this, and that's fine. But God loves it all because He loves us all. He looks at the heart. Before we talk about some of the practices, I simply want to focus a little bit on the heart of worship. Just simply, I think it's important that we recognize worship is always from the heart. It starts in the heart. It continues in the heart. God is not concerned with merely outward form as much as he is the condition of our hearts. What's going on inside, not just what's going on outside. We can do all the right things outwardly. And there's a lot of people, they get real excited, they get real riled up, and they really go for it. You know, there's a lot of people that bop and hop and twitch and fitch and do all that. And their hearts are nothing like that. God knows. We're not here to judge each other. We don't stop anybody or start anybody. We don't need to do that, but we just know this, is that our heart has to be right with God. And that's something that we must do. One of the reasons I receive communion, probably every service that I'm a part of, is simply because I want to be right with the Lord, and it's only through His precious blood. And communion isn't necessarily me getting right with God, it's me reflecting on what Jesus has done. And in a sense, it's saying, it's because of your blood and your body that I'm right with you. And that's why I receive communion uh, in, in, in worship is because I'm just saying it's because of you that I'm right with you. And I, my expression comes out of the cross. It comes out of the resurrection and putting my faith in that and I'm just honoring him and his finished work. In chapter one of Isaiah, the Lord speaks through the prophet and he tells the people that he is burdened by their outward worship because of how corrupt they had become. He's like, your hearts are corrupt. You're doing all the outward things, but but it smells, it's stinky. I mean, he just is saying to them like, this is terrible. What you're doing on the outward is nothing what I really want because it doesn't, it's it's not what's on the inside. Your hearts are wrong. And Jesus, as we've been studying Mark, the gospel of Mark, we've seen in Mark chapter seven was just this last week or a week ago. And this is what Jesus says to the Pharisees when they're mad that His disciples didn't wash their hands. You remember the story? They didn't wash their hands and they're mad. They're like, why are your disciples not washing your hands? And they have impure hands. In other other words, they're not right with God. Why are you okay with that? And Jesus says, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, you actors, you imposters. As it is written, this people, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are so far away from me. In vain do they worship me teaching as doctrines and precepts, the precepts of men, neglecting the commandment of God, holding to the tradition of men. There are a lot of traditions. Now, our church comes from the Pentecostal tradition. We're Christian Orthodox, so we believe the tenets of the faith that have been passed down to us. 
And that, that doesn't come from Pentecostalism. That comes from Christianity. But as a distinction, we are a Pentecostal church, which just simply means we believe in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. But Pentecostals got a lot of problems. Can I get an amen? Sometimes we're very guilty, and maybe you don't identify this way, but I certainly do. We're, we're very guilty with doing all the outward stuff, but not necessarily doing all the things that Jesus wants us to from the heart. He wants us to forgive and release people. He wants us to love and not neglect the weightier matters of the law, which is to have mercy and to love people and to release compassion. He wants those things. At the same time, we're hopping, bopping, and you know all of that. And we're raising our hand. Now, I raise my hands as an expression, but I do so also knowing that I have to have a surrendered heart. Sometimes people go into these environments and they stir it up and they're all excited and they're like, oh man, worship was amazing. And I'm like, did God say that or was it just good for you? Because last time I checked, it wasn't for you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like we can get all excited. Like, wow, that was fantastic. Worship was so amazing. So I'm always wondering, are you discerning that the Spirit of God was released in power and the Father was smiling on his people, lifting their praise to him? Or are you just saying like it was, there was a real good jam? Were the drums really banging? Was the bass really flowing? Was the electric gu guitar, you know, hitting them licks? Were the singers really good? You know, what was it? Were we slamming in this room or, or was God pleased? Do you see, do you see what I'm saying? We, we, we miss the heart of worship sometimes because we love an environment that makes us emotionally excited. Now, we all have got emotions, but you've got to be careful in that we're giving God that sometimes our emotions have nothing to do with sacrifice. There's sometimes like, I am, I am not excited about the sacrifice that God is asking me for. It's not like a smile on my face, but you know, afterwards I realize that I want to bring the Father pleasure, and so I obey or I surrender or I do the thing He's calling me to do, and it's sometimes that flood of emotion comes afterwards, but not necessarily before. So I don't always think about it the same way. Sometimes it's, it's great, and I love the, the environment. Let's jump and bop and do the little two-step thing people do that looks like the cheerleader that didn't make the grade. You can do all that. It's fine. It's okay. That's fine. You do you. I'm not looking at you. In fact, I don't look at anybody. When I worship, I'm worshiping God. I don't look around and go, hey, look at, well, she must be really feeling it tonight. I don't do that, you know. But how do we engage our hearts in this thing that we call worship? Just focusing a little bit on like worship together, corporate worship. Worshiping together as God's people, singing to the Lord, um, coming together in all that we do here, not just singing, but that included Number one is we need to plan to worship. We need to plan. Where our treasure is, Jesus said, there our heart will be also. You know what your greatest treasure is? It's your time. That's the greatest treasure that you have. You can make more money, right? You can, you can get more stuff. There's a lot of things in this world we call treasure. It's not really worth that much before God at all. It's fleeting, the Bible even says. And so what we need to remember is that time is the thing that we can't get more of. And it's very precious. You have only so much time in a day. So when you make a choice to give your time to something, it really shows what matters. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. So if we want our heart to engage in worship, our time is our greatest treasure. Where we choose to give our time is very important. Planning to worship is making a commitment to worship in the secret place with the Lord alone, but then also in the gathering place with God's people. And I'll be honest with you as a pastor for now over 20 years, I can actually say that now, been a pastor over 20 years, I know that in the American church, the time where we gather to sing and worship is not for many people the most exciting part of the service. And that's a reality. That's, that's the reality. And so one of the practical things in planning to worship is I'm encouraging you as much as you can. I mean, some of you, if you're coming from work, you know you're going to be a little late if you get off work late, but be early. Amen? P prepare, plan. I'm here on time. Like, I'm not just going to show up at a different time because, because, and I could have come. This is really important. And the same thing happens for our time in the secret place. 
Now, I'm not trying to build some legalistic scaffolding for you, but I'm just encouraging you that we have to plan to engage our hearts because we, time is a precious commodity. Time is our treasure. And so if we give our time to something, it says something about what we believe and it says something about how we really feel about this thing. And so I encourage you, if you're not feeling it, do it anyways, because time is still valuable whether we feel it or not. Say amen. Amen. Right? Amen. It's just the truth. And the second thing we we can do to engage our hearts in worship is we can prepare to worship. Look what Ecclesiastes 5 says, verse 1. He says, guard your steps as you go to the house of God and draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. Do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Look at this phrase, guard your steps. And it means to walk with reverence, being mindful and prayerful as you come into, the, into, as you come into God's presence. The point is this, that we don't come casually because we know who we're meeting with. That's what the writer of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, is saying, is that we don't come casually because God, God is the one we're meeting with. I mean, if you and I were to have an appointment with some important person in the world, I bet you some of you, like let's say a very important person in the world in terms of the world's eyes said, I'm going to come to your house for dinner. I bet you that we would clean our house. I bet you we would dress up. Women would put their makeup on. Men would probably wear a suit or a tie or something. Some of you would buy a new house, you know? I mean, we'd probably... we'd. Off our kids for a few days. I mean, we would probably do a lot of stuff to prepare ourselves. Understand, we would do, we would do that if we had some type of opportunity. What Ecclesiastes is saying is that you are meeting with God. So let your words be few and guard your steps when you come to the house of God. Have a mind that is fixed on what you're doing and who you're meeting with. Don't offer a sacrifice of fools. People that just stumble and fumble into it and don't really consider the person that they're meeting with. This is God. He allows us to come before him and to come before his throne, not casually, but carefully, seriously, sincerely. So we come with the same care that Moses did when he encountered God in the burning bush. And the first thing that the Lord said was what? Take off your shoes because you're standing on holy ground. I wonder if the voice of God spoke to any of us today. What would you do if you heard that voice? The voice of God saying something practical like take off your shoes right now. We Would we do that? Knowing that we're in the presence of an almighty God, like worshiping him, like the privilege that it is to come into his presence and he's take off your shoes. There's a profound reality attached to why he would say that. But I would encourage you to pray before you come. Read scripture before you come. Repent before you come. Jesus talked about your heart being right. Don't just come and offer some kind of thing. Make sure that as you come, that your heart is right. Look what he said in Matthew 5, 23. He said, therefore, if you are presenting an offering at the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. What is he saying? Preparing to worship means that we reconcile anything that is outstanding before we try to present something to God and act like it's not there. God wants us to stand in his presence and ensure that we're not living a double life, that we're not unwilling to, to forgive and to reconcile. Friends, I'm serious right now. If we're living in bitterness and unforgiveness and some type of sin and we want to just offer to God some type of thanksgiving and sacrifice, the Lord speaks to us and says, you know what I want from you? I want you to make that right and then I want you to come and lift your hands. And if we can't do that right now, then we lift our hands right now and we make it right. We make ourselves right with God. It's so vital that we do this because truthfully, Worship is vertical and it's horizontal. It's first vertical. It's being right with God. And when we're right with God, we're offering him a true, sincere, heartfelt worship. We're not avoiding the things in our life that Jesus calls us to deal with and then acting like it's not there when we're in his presence. If you're married and you have an unreconciled issue, You can't just act. I mean, people do this all the time, but your marriage doesn't get better if you just go on like it's not really there. If you have an unreconciled thing with your spouse and you just come home and you're like, what's for dinner? What are we doing tonight? Can't wait to go out and eat with you. But there's this really massive issue that you know they've asked you to deal with 
and you just avoid it and cover over it and act like it's not there, friends, that relationship is not being valued. And that's what the Bible teaches us about worship is Jesus is telling us his heart, which is really what we want to know. If you want to know the heart of Jesus, he says to us, here's what I want you to do if you're unreconciled with somebody. And as much as it depends on you, sometimes we can't. I'm not putting a burden on you you can't fulfill. But if there's something that we're avoiding or we haven't done, he's saying, make that thing right. I love it when I pray with somebody as a response to the word of God in our worship service, and I tell them, hey, you know, this is what you need to do in responding and forgiveness and releasing that bitterness or whatever God's calling them to do. I love how the word and our time in worship releases our hearts to give ourselves fully to the Lord because the flesh wants to take over, doesn't Isn't that true? And listen, what happens when we go down those roads is we sophisticate a religious experience rather than persist in our relationship with the Lord. The flesh does not get better, it gets more religious unless we discard it and walk by the Spirit. And this is what it means to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, is to deal with those things. The final part of this I want to share with you just a few minutes is the practices of worship. What I share in this section is feels exclusive to corporate worship, but it applies personally as, as well. But I, I think it's important just to bring up what the Bible teaches. It gives lots of examples that are important to us because we want to know what it says. Why do people raise their hands? Why do people get all excited? Why do people shout? Why do people do these things? Well, the Bible has a lot to say. The psalmist said in 103 in verse 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me, bless his holy name. I don't know if you've ever thought about this psalm before, but what he's saying is that he's saying to himself, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. It's sort of like this thing where you have to encourage yourself. You've got to tell yourself to worship the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my, start out like that. I just bless the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. This is how we begin, whether that's in the secret place or the gathering place. But there's a list that you have that I'm sharing with you today. And it's this, we give thanks to the Lord. When we come together, we give thanks. A lot of Bible verses there for you to see this. We have a grateful heart, a thankful heart. We give God thanks. The second is we sing to the Lord. God is not interested in how well you sing, just the genuineness of of your heart. Everybody say amen. amen. You better say a better amen than that. You know, if you're like me, you know, sometimes... You're glad that the Lord is the only one that hears you. And he can interpret your love language. Number three is we shout to the Lord. The Bible speaks of shouting and victory and praise and adoration in the assembly. Some of us, that's what we do. I shout. I mean, I clap. I, I, I know a couple of you get a little maybe nerve-wracked when it happens, but this is biblical. We shout. Why? Because of what God has done. People shout for games and Movies and all kinds of stuff. People shout for all this other stuff. You could shout for God. I mean, don't shock someone while you shout. Don't shout at someone. Shout to the Lord. Lift your head up and shout to God. Don't do it in someone else's face or next to your neighbor. Amen. There's a way that you might want to do this. The Bible tells us to lift holy hands to the Lord. Look at all these passages. This is only like a percentage, maybe 10% of how many passages talk about lifting your hands to the Lord. When God captures your heart, that's what we do. Friends, I want to encourage you. If you're a person that says, I don't like to lift my hands, lift your hands to God. Lift your hands to God. It's don't lift your hands to others. Lift your hands to the Lord. And this is a surrender. I surrender to you. I bless you. I honor you. No one else. God is above it all. This is what we're saying. He's above it all. But there's also something about having your hands out to the Lord. It's that you receive. There's an exchange. It's you're blessing the Lord and you're surrendering to the Lord, but you're receiving what he has. Worship is always an exchange because he's the one that created us. It's the creation giving back to the creator. We also kneel before the Lord. Many Bible verses talk about kneeling before. Worship means to bow down or to bow low. Sometimes we need to kneel. Friends, that's what we need to do. I know it's hard to get people to to kneel, to take a knee. We do that for all kinds of other things, but if we're ever going to do that, may we do that for the Lord.
This is another posture of surrender. When we get on our knees, we're posturing our hearts before a holy, a righteous, and an all-powerful God. And we're saying, you have done great things. You are greater than me. I am not God. You are God. People in all kinds of other religions are bowing to not the real God. And yet here we are with the one and the true living God, and we, we don't just want to say our hearts are right with Him, but there are physical things the Scripture tells us to do because it is indicative of our heart. That's the idea here, is that what we do in the physical can often be true of what's happening inside in our heart. We dance before the Lord. Some of you want to do that. Some of you try to do that. There's always a place and space for that at different times. But the Bible talks about dancing before the Lord. 2 Samuel 6, 14, Psalm 149. We wait upon the Lord. We're listening to God speak. He wants to speak when we're worshiping Him. Sometimes we're worshiping Him. Sometimes we just need to take a step back and listen. Even when everybody else is singing, it's not about liturgy, doing the right thing at the right time. It's that these are all expressions of a physical expression of worship. And then the final one is, or the other one is, we give to the Lord. This is an expression of worship. We give from our heart. We don't just give from our pocketbook. But while we give what we have, the financial means that we have, when people tithe, which we'll talk about next week, I know you're excited about that. But when we give of our finances, Jesus actually said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I'll share more with you about that next week. We sing in the spirit. We sing in the spiritual language. This is a form of worship as well. These are all practices. And there's others, but these are biblical practices that I encourage you toward. In our congregation, this is something that we want to endeavor toward. Is not the worship of man or these things that we think like, man, this is a really great service if we do all of these things all the time, but rather like this is a place where we give to the Lord from our heart and physically he's going to lead us to this. There have been times in my life where the Lord's like, I want you to kneel every time when you're in my presence, every time. And, and then he lifts that. But you need to follow the Lord and know that that's a form of worship to God. That's what he asks for you, for you to do. When's the last time that you did that? When's the last time that you knelt before the Lord? When's the last time you took a knee? When's the last time you came forward to an altar call and said, I surrender to God? When's the last time you let God consume your heart and overwhelm you? And as you looked up and you saw Jesus as big as he is, like he was just compelled, like, what do I got to do? And a preacher sometimes only has to say one thing, come to the altar and you're like, oh, you can't get out of your seat fast enough. Do you remember those days? Do you remember those times? You're just responding. That's all it is. It's not about the preacher or the message or some sort of emotion that's evoked, but rather it's like we're consumed with God and I want to respond some way to God because of who he is. Well, as I close, I wanted to share this um, passage with you because it sort of summed it all up to me. In Psalm 138, it's in our Bible reading today, if you're following our plan. The psalmist writes, I give thanks with all my heart, and I will sing praises to you before the gods. It's a little g. It's not an acknowledgement that there are many gods. It's talking about idols. It's talking about the idols of the other nations. So the psalmist says, Worship is a full expression of love and gratitude in the face of options. Listen to this. I will worship you before the gods. I will give to you my honor, all honor and all praise in the midst of all these other options, all of these other people that are giving themselves over to other gods that are not gods at all. In the face of all this adversity and all this difficulty and all these options and all these other things, I will worship you. You know, worship is also warfare. Worship is warfare because all of these other idols and all these other things are seeking our affection, our response. I mean, just look at advertisement. It's pulling on us to give our money, to give our time, to give something and really, you know, honestly, to give all of ourself, to give to the things of the world, lesser things. God, he doesn't have to advertise. <laughs> He's the real thing. 
If you want an advertisement from God for your affection, just go outside and look at the clouds. Just go, go outside, climb a mountain, look at what God made. This is advertisement. It's pretty good, don't you think? Kind of beats like everything else. He's like, yep, I'm God, did all this, that's me. Now come and worship. Bow down before me, know who I am, give yourself to me fully, completely, without reservation. Worship is acknowledging he's God and we're not. He is God and we are not. Hey, Lord, some things don't make sense. I am God and you are not. I didn't get all that I asked for. I am God and you are not. We don't worship him because we got what we asked for. We don't worship him because we got everything we ever wanted. We don't worship him because our life worked out exactly to plan. We don't worship him because every day is filled with external joy. We worship him because he's God. He's God. And if we see him as God first, then we see that he doesn't have to be loving and he doesn't have to be merciful and he doesn't have to be kind and patient, but he is. And so now we can worship him because he's God, but then the kind of God that he is overwhelms us. That's what's amazing to me. We worship you for who you are and for what you've done. Remember um, Satan in Matthew chapter 4 It says he brought Jesus to the top of the mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their glory. And Satan says to Jesus, if you bow down and worship me, I will give you all of this. I will give you the world. And Jesus responds out of Deuteronomy chapter eight. He says, go Satan. That that means not today, Satan. He says, go. Deuteronomy says this, it is written, to worship the Lord your God and to serve him only. I want to write a book called Serve Him Only. It's a book someday I'm going to write. Serve Him Only. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And Satan departed. The enemy's trying to solicit us. That's why the psalmist says this. He said, I worshiped you in the middle of all the other gods. I worshiped you in the middle of all the other options, all the other solicitations, all the other temptations. I made a decision right there that I will worship you just like Jesus reiterates to the enemy when the solicitation of the enemy comes to sin and to give yourself to something else. No, no, I will worship the Lord my God and I will serve him only. That's our response to every temptation in our life. Every temptation is an opportunity not to do something sinful, but to worship God in the midst of an option. This is what God calls us to. Do you have a sin problem? turn it into worship. Do you have an issue in your life? Do you have a, do you have a focus problem where you need, you need more of God and you need to see him better than you do? You need to see him clearer and bigger than you do? Do you have, do you have a sin issue? Is there something consuming you? We need, we need to have a worship problem. It's not a problem, but we need to have a worship focus. Shift it. That's what we need to do. 